You're listening to The Red Shed Tapes, and I'm your host, Shannon McMiniman. My family operates many historical properties in Oregon and Washington. Our business may be pubs and beer, but our goal is to celebrate and connect with the people that have helped to define each McMiniman's property, to bring the past into the present. <laughs> well, can I get y'all anything else at the moment? Today, the walls inside your neighborhood McMiniman's are infused with local history, archival photos, curious artifacts, and artistic portraits. The faces in the pictures are both novel and familiar. Have you ever wondered, who are these people? Why is this here? And how is this all possible? Okay, let me explain what I mean with a story about the Godfather of Soul. There wasn't a minute over the weekend that I wasn't just pouring over anything I could read about James Brown. This is Tim Hills, our company historian. He interviewed James Brown on his return visit to the Crystal Ballroom in the early aughts. I dug up as much information as I could from old newspapers, from magazines, whatever, biographies, and talked to people around Portland, because James Brown had come to the Crystal as far back as the 50s. Tim wasn't able to find much in the public records because in this era, black artists were not supported by mainstream media. You know, a lot of Portland had no idea these black performers ever came through. It wasn't publicized except for posters on the telephone poles. You had to go into the neighborhoods and go to the record store like Bop City Records where they sold all the black artists records I just idolized the old soul music. The night came and his manager was saying, you know, he, he's old now and he may not want to see anybody. I'm at the door of his dressing room and uh, the, he's got this huge guy standing <laughs> outside the door. Uh, who is making sure no one's going in or out unless he wants you to do that. And, you know, he was about 10 feet tall and knocks on the door and he says, and then he turns to me and says, okay, you can go in. So I go in and there's James Brown sitting in a chair. I started talking to him and, and talking about people that had really helped him in his early career and details about this stuff. Do you remember of what year was the first time he came through? I figured he wouldn't remember the booker who would book bands all the way up the coast from San Francisco to Seattle. And his name was Charles Sullivan and the Crystal was one of the stops here in Portland. Charles was the legendary San Francisco promoter who not only created the tour map for black musicians, he put Crystal Ballroom on the map. He's the reason so many R&B and soul artists played the ballroom in the 50s and 60s. And he drove a Cadillac and cruises into town and you know gets the posters out where they need to go and the free tickets that people could win and the records that could be sold. Um, and all of that, you know, were in boxes in the back seat and in the trunk of the Cadillac. Another big guy, I'm hoping you remember, uh, Charles Sullivan. James, when I brought up his name, immediately lit up and said, oh, Charles, yes, he was fantastic. He was such a help for my career, you know, and it just turned out to be a bigger story. That man was like dead. He me and, and we just had this amazing discussion. And that's the other thing, is James Brown got up out of his seat three, four times to come over and shake my hand because I brought up this stuff that really meant something to him that nobody would ever ask him about. These folks who did the promotion for these shows in Portland, you know, they were the local guys. That just felt so good. Something I'll never forget. In this episode of the Red Shed Tapes, we're talking about history. 
and how history is an integral part of the McMinniman's experience at every level and how it continues to shape what we build in unexpected ways. We'll get into how we hooked up with Tim, who you just heard from, the events his research inspired, the department he created, his collaboration with the motley crew of company artists, and his process for historical preservation. Later, self-proclaimed McMenamin's drag queen, Poison Waters, herself, will connect us with the part of Portland's queer history that we celebrate today. And then, a brief stop in McMinnville, Oregon, for close encounters of the third kind. Grab a pint and settle in. When people hear we have a history department, they're often surprised. And maybe it's one of the first clues that what my dad Mike and Uncle Brian have created at McMinniman's goes way beyond burgers and beer. That's always the question, who would have a history department? That's my dad Mike. You know, other people might think that's absurd, especially in the restaurant business when it's hard to make money anyway. And then if you're trying to do a lot of art and history research along the way, we were fortunate that we had a, a strong pub foundation to begin this whole thing. History wasn't always a part of the thing, or rather, the McMinniman's experience. It's something that's developed over the decades, that developed into a department. The small but mighty force at McMinniman's, responsible for so many things you see at our properties. The signs above the door, sometimes the door itself, the fixtures on the walls, the art on the ceiling, the records in the box, and the posters on the wall. Our first stop is at the Mission Theater in Northwest Portland. Today, when you walk into the Mission, you'll see an intimate venue with an ornate balcony filled with comfy theater seats surrounding a dance floor and stage. You might not suspect that underneath rock stars and raucous crowds is where our historians research and archive our company treasures. Yep, we're heading into the subterranean archives of the History Department. My name's John Smart. I'm the history department manager. I usually come down to the theater basement and get on and see if anybody's asked any pressing history questions. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) And we're in the archives. And we are surrounded by boxes and boxes and boxes (laughs) that are filled with papers. And I mean, God, what else? There's like little cassette tapes and there's all kinds of strange things that are on shelves. We got a bottle of Edgefield 1991 extra dry sparkling Riesling. So that was probably one of our first attempts at a champagne style sparkling. Oh, well this t-shirt that I found the other day of the one millionth keg. I think I've seen some brewers wearing that. Yeah, this was made for the brewers at the time. Uh, We end up with all little things like that. It's historical in some way. (laughs) John starts to point out more historical artifacts, signed baseballs from pro players of the past, cigars circa the Prohibition era discovered under a dance floor, even a folder labeled evidence with a prop gun inside. Okay, we really do have a lot of historical items here in the basement. The sheet music we found underneath the floorboards in the Crystal Ballroom. The copyright on it is from the late 30s. That was trumpet music and Hoagie Carmichael was the composer of the music. Blue Orchids is the name of the song. Jimmy Dorsey recorded it in the 40s, and so it was really cool to just listen to that and think about that playing in the Crystal Ballroom while people were dancing. Many of our properties are historical and informed by the building's former lives. Take the mission, where we are. It has a long and storied past, from Swedish churchgoers to longshoremen from actors to beer-drinking film buffs. I mean, my first memory of the Mission Theater was coming to see E.T. with my soccer team. And that was probably, like, around the time that it opened. It was in the 80s, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Mission Theater opened in 87. It was one of the first theaters that McMinniman's opened up as a place that you could drink a beer, get a pizza, watch a movie. You can do that pretty much everywhere now, but that was pretty rare back in 1987. John seems at home here, but his path to the history department was not a direct one. When he graduated from college with a history degree, he was trying to figure out what he could do with it. Someone told him to check out McMenamin's. 
I did come to McMinimins because I wanted to get involved in the history department. I didn't think it would take 17 years to get there, but... <laughs> you heard that uh, right. So I got 17 years. Got like many people in this company, guys. he's had a lot of different job. roles. I saw a delivery driver for McMinimins. I was like, I can do that. And a new job came up, so I was able to work my way into facilities. John kept his eye on the history department, and all the while, he was developing priceless insider knowledge of McMinimins' properties and people. He has personally assembled artifacts, hung art and history on the walls with my dad, and had his hands on just about everything. With his eclectic experience, John brings another dimension of meaning and depth to his role in the history department. Yeah, I mean, it was pretty different, you know, finding a place that valued the history enough to have someone on staff. When John says, someone on staff, it's because for many years, we had just one historian, Tim. It's an amazing opportunity, amazing job to be able to work with artists and musicians and coffee roasters and, you know, gardeners. There's just not another company or opportunity like this. I can't think of a better job for me. If you live in the Pacific Northwest and you love history, you may have run into Tim at a McMinniman's History Pub. When I think of Tim, I definitely picture his hair. Yeah, it's amazing. Like, it may be one of the first things you notice about him, but it's his inquisitiveness and unassuming presence that just makes you want to tell him your story. Here's how he discovered McMinimins back in the 90s. At the time, my wife and I, we had just recently moved to Portland, and the Fulton Pub became a favorite place of ours, and pretty quickly, you know, we discovered Hawthorne and the Barley Mill and the Baghdad, and we started to put together, oh, these are all the same people, you know, the same company doing this stuff. And it just dawned on me, these places have stories. Where are the stories? At the same time that Tim started wondering about the stories, my dad and Uncle Brian had just discovered how powerful incorporating history into a property could be. At our Edgefield Hotel property, they had worked with Sharon Nesbitt, a journalist and founding member of the Troutdale Historical Society. Sharon invited people who used to work and live at Edgefield to walk the halls with our artists and share their stories to inspire the art. This was a pivotal moment looking back, because Sharon showed us how powerful it was to talk to the community. Here's my Uncle Brian. It's really neat to see it, but the locals, you know, when they come down, they've taken pride and ownership in it too, because they're looking at the history of their town on the walls. From that moment on, my dad and Uncle Brian were hooked. You can start thinking more about the history and stuff. History was always important to us because dad, uh, Bob McMenamin, was always into history. He took us to uh, state sales, took us to museums. There was a state history quarterly or something that came through, and he always had those. So there was all these old relics, you know, cool things that you were always kind of connected with. So that was just in the DNA, I think. I think it is in the DNA, because during my freshman year in college, I worked in the history department with Tim to research, among other things, our Hillsdale location. My whole summer was spent bouncing around between records offices, the Oregon Historical Society, and the downtown Portland Library. Then, at the end of the day, checking in with Tim to show him what I'd found. It was so much fun. I was hooked, too. We can't talk about history at McMinimins without talking about art, because over our 41 years in business, they become synonymous. It gives it a whole other level for a customer, I think. I mean, it, again, and it goes into the, I always call it like the fourth dimension. You know, it gives it depth and gravity. It draws people in. In other words, the depth and gravity from combining art and history gives the experience more dimension. You can feel it when you're in a place, but you might not recognize it. So let's take a step back. Before Tim Hills and my dad and uncle ever got together, there were eight or nine pubs, and the artists would paint whatever they wanted there. As my dad put it, we had good-sized walls to cover. Here are artists Lyle Hain and Kalia Bush in an archival recording from a history pub led by Tim Hills back in 2015. They explain how the artwork started out as practical. Some of the work is just about nothing. It's just decorative because uh, there wasn't any research. Well, before Edgefield... There were like eight or nine pubs. And you just painted, like, 
whatever you wanted, crazy, right. wild. It's very informal. Yeah. So Mike did yeah. have an input. I would paint at the Fulton, whatever came into my head, and I never heard back if it was acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> that stuff's still there. <laughs> Some of it. Joe I painted at the Thompson Brew Pub in Salem, and he painted everything in all-encompassing psychedelic insanity. And that, that's what, you know, he'd go and do that every night. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of fun. Yeah. <laughs> Mall 205 was based on the signs that were fake beers ads. And the oh. snail just happened to be in there because I put a snail in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the early pubs didn't really have a, some local thing attached to it. Before we just kind of piecemealed it together just from people's stories and from, you know, no, not professionally, more just bar over the bar top stories from regulars. Yeah. Bar talk. <laughs> yeah. But when we got into the Crystal Ballroom. The Crystal Ballroom was the very first one to be researched. That was like the that. first one we really got into. My dad couldn't really devote the time, but he knew the building had power in history. He described the place in the late 60s as having a kind of underground current. And it's this era that had really captured his imagination. He and my uncle knew they needed to go after it. When I heard about the Crystal Ballroom, you know, it was press about the renovation of it. And so I got the contact from Mike and uh, sent him a letter and he said, let's meet up and talk over stuff. And uh, that was just one of the best days of my life. Here's Tim at the Crystal, describing that first meeting. And I'm looking up and seeing these amazing tall windows where the ballroom is on the third floor. I walk up the narrow stairway and come into the back end of the ballroom and it just opens up and I'm blown away. It was just the two of us hanging out in the middle of a completely vacant, rundown ballroom, but it was gorgeous and exciting. And I couldn't wait to dig in. We were buzzing off each other pretty good. I just remember that it was obvious that we needed to work together. Mike was really excited about the project too, and he really wanted to uh, have the history of the place revealed. And man, that's exactly what I wanted to do too. So Tim came on board to dig into the colorful history of the Crystal Ballroom, and the collaboration sparked a fire that still burns today. You know, from the start, with our relationship, we were both like little kids, you know. It was like, you won't believe what just turned up. He was excited. He got me excited. Uh, we were both excited, so we excited each other. Every day it was a, like, James Brown played there in 1959, you know, and you go, what? Just that kind of stuff. Folks like Garnett Mims and the Enchanters, fantastic. Wilson Pickett, incredible. The Temptations, Ike and Tina Turner, of course. Junior Walker and the All-Stars. It's just the top of that time period. They've got them all coming through the crystal. There was no expectation, but it was just remarkable in the sense that all of these projects would reveal <laughs> this incredible stuff you'd never ever believe would be connected with these places. There was so much, because, I mean, it ended up being a book, right? From that first project, the stories Tim uncovered didn't just end up on the walls. They also went into a book he wrote called The Many Lives of the Crystal Ballroom. His research also influenced the renovation when he uncovered the blueprint for the floating floor, which we were then able to recreate on the second floor in Lola's room for smaller shows. None of that would have been possible without Tim's research. So it just kind of opened our eyes to the power that's there that you don't know about unless you really have somebody that can really get into it and Tim obviously loved what he did mm -hmm. it was easy mm -hmm. we got together and uh, chased history everywhere still are the crystal ballroom is where and when the history department was born about seven years into our family's brew pub business inside the ballroom today you can see circular murals on the walls surrounding the floating floor. 
They're bordered by hundreds of light bulbs. You'll notice on each of the beams in between the murals, you see this jester face. And a lot of people think, oh, that's great. McMenamin's put those in. And it's not true. They've been there since 1914 when the place opened. And of course, if you know the lore back hundreds of years, the jester was always the performer, the musician, and that seems perfect for the architectural flourish that the jester provides. Before Tim came on, art was happening, but there wasn't really a direction. So in half of the murals, the artists were already riffing off the existing jester theme. But the second half, thanks to Tim, portrays stories about characters and communities that had a specific connection to the ballroom. The art became more intricate, more referential. For example, in one mural, Lyle Hain painted the history of Ralph Ferrier, who was not only an owner of the ballroom for 30 years, but also ran a coffin-making business out of the building. And there is a mural by artist Joe Cotter in the center of the south wall. It depicts the Romani Feasts of the Dead, held in the ballroom in the 50s and 60s. Tim explains how that came about. When a member of the community passed away, they would go to the burial at the graveyard, and then following that, they would have these feasts of the dead. And uh, literally hundreds of people from the community would come here, and there would be barbecued meats that they would bring in, kegs of beer, musicians singing, it was a celebration of their lives. The artists really made it come alive. One of our artists, Jenny Joyce, says it really well. History and art add a dimension to the experience that's hard to monetize. But it's about the importance of community and restoring not just the building, but the legacy of what came before. It's the fourth dimension my Uncle Brian talked about earlier. When it comes to the McMinimans experience, it's everything. Tim's research goes beyond inspiring art. His process for unearthing history has helped us create live events that connect us to each other. It didn't happen quickly. You gather all this information, and along the way you meet some really interesting people who have plenty to talk about that will make us understand what's so special about those particular properties. Then you try and coax some of these people who initially had this experience in the property. And if we can get them involved and have them tell their own story, that's where everything kind of started. Tim has created living connections and relationships that bridge past and present. Like Poison Waters, a well-known Portland drag queen who has been hosting events at McMiniman since 2011. I didn't know that it was Tim who first met Poison Waters until just recently. And of course, we'd love to take credit for discovering her, but Poison has been performing drag and co-hosting at Darcel 15 Showplace since the 1990s. What's going to happen today is we're going to play drag queen bingo, which is bingo, with drag queens. So that's me. Poison Waters is a huge talent, a wonderful person, and a professional through and through, even when she's calling you out from on stage. Hi, welcome. Look at your little choo-choo ballerina skirt and your fabulous bag. And you're late. Sit your ass down. So in 2011, the McMinimans folks opened the Crystal Hotel in downtown Portland, which had previously been the Silverado, a gay men's strip club. And Tim Hills, who I fell in love with immediately, he contacted me and said that my name came up when they were researching what had been on the property before. So I had hosted a show called The Church of the Poison Mine for about 10 years at the Silverado. From Tim's research, we knew this whole area, previously named Stark Street, now Harvey Milk Street, had been rich in queer history. But Poison Waters lived that history and could speak to it. I came in and they said, would you, they asked me if I would just host a show, a little happy hour show in Al's Den down below, which used to be the Silverado. And so of course they did that. And I was only supposed to be one day, the first day. And it was so much fun. And I was such a hit, if I do say so myself, that they said, oh my gosh, can you come back the rest of the week and do the whole opening. And so we did. And they said, okay, well now your show is a really big hit and it's such a great connection. So can you just come once a month and do the show in Al's Den? 
And that's how it all started. I was just supposed to be a one-time wonder, and here I am now, 13 years later. Today, in addition to the building being on the National Historic Register, the Crystal Hotel has been designated a National Historic Site for the LGBTQ plus community. And you can find Poison Waters hosting brunch, the Academy Awards, and of course, Drag Queen Bingo on a monthly basis across our properties. That's what Tim's connection led to. I see you, I hear you, I support you. I support you in your journey. How else has historical research shaped McMinimins as we know it today? Well, if you've ever passed through McMinnville in May and seen thousands of people dressed as aliens and parading down the main street, you might not immediately suspect that Tim's quiet research at the county library was behind it. But it was. We've landed in McMinnville, Oregon. Welcome to our planet. <laughs> In 2000, we were renovating Hotel Oregon, a historic hotel in the heart of McMinnville in wine country. And Tim uncovered the story of a UFO sighting from 1950 on a family farm just down the road. You know, it was the Trent site, the farmer who <laughs> saw it up in the sky and he told his wife to run in and get the camera and came out and he took two photos. It was like boom, boom, as it's going across the sky. The photos were published in Life magazine, and to this day are undisputed by experts. Headlines around the world read, Farmer Trent's Flying Saucer, and at long last, authentic photographs of a flying saucer? I hadn't seen the photos in a while, so I wanted to take another look. They're black and white photos of a typical flying saucer shape hovering in the middle of what appears to be a clear sky, backed by Oregon hills and trees. First of all, I will say, I was not interested, per se, about the subject, but I'm like, that's just too wild. We have to do something. But I found Bruce Maccabee, a UFO researcher. He had been studying this for years, and the Trent case was the one that he was the expert on. My analysis of the complete case leads me to believe that the Trents are actually telling the truth. An unusual object did fly. We got him a plane ticket and brought him out here. And uh, all these people showed up, so many more than I thought would, coming from all parts of the country. We hosted him in our Paragon room in the Hotel Oregon, and it was packed. Thank you, guys. People were out in the dining area trying to hear what he was saying. I didn't at first even think, oh, well, let's do another one next year. But we did. And then in the third year, the thing that blew it up and made it incredible was to add the parade. And that's what drew all the people. Today, it has grown to be the second largest UFO festival in the nation after Roswell, New Mexico. The whole community comes together to participate, and it's part of McMinnville's Main Street charm. But a huge part of the event continues to be the incredible variety of speakers, from ufologists to first-hand witnesses to former government employees. In 2025, it's going to be the 25th annual celebration, and it's going to be stellar. I was always looking out for things that personify what this place has been, you know, initially and how it may have changed. A lot of the original use for these properties changed quite a bit. But I guess the one constant is the group of people who came over all those years, you know, and their stories and their experiences. Tim realized people have stories to tell, and he wanted to give them a platform to share. So he created McMiniman's History Pubs. Part of my job immediately was to talk to people who had some connection to the properties. In the process of doing that and meeting up with these folks and hearing their stories and photos and other things they might want to share, it's like, wow. We should be doing more than just stories. And of course, history goes very well with beer. While today Tim continues to research, historian Alicia Scholl runs History Pubs. 
Hi, my name's Alicia Scholl, and I work in the history department. Um, I started out with Tim. I'm in charge of putting the history pubs together, which have actually gone on for a really long time, over 10, 15 years, I want to say. We bring in historians, authors, um, sometimes it's firsthand experiencers, people who have a story to tell about local history. And she was at that time the first woman to be a policewoman in the United States. But sometimes we have documentaries um, about a historical topic. We especially like to focus on the history of Pacific Northwest in general. They'd say, here comes those slap town boys. It's always a really fun time because you can have a beer and eat and drink and, you know, listen to a lecture in a more, like, casual atmosphere. My dad has yet to find anything that doesn't mix with beer. And as Tim said, history seems to go quite well with it. The people are watching here are just going bonkers. <laughs> history pubs are happening regularly across our properties in Oregon and Washington. History is important because, I mean, that's our life. That's, that's where we are, you know. It's just part of what yeah. makes us us. So, we research and bring the history to life at our locations. We invite community members who live the history into the fold. And we put on events to celebrate the historical revelations. Tim really created a map for how we approach these projects. And he not only influenced the way we do things here, he instilled in people a different way to think about history and has shaped present and future historians. I got a taste of that as an intern, but I wanted to hear from other people. So we reached out to Caitlin Pop, a historian who researched one of our most recent properties, Elks Temple in Tacoma, Washington. It really is a treasure hunt. We are given very surface level amount of information about these buildings. So it was our job to go a little deeper. And I spent a lot of time up in Tacoma in the archives of the library, fishing for um, just the little hidden treasures. There's a lot of forgotten history when it comes to historic buildings that we steward. You know, we would hear names and we would look up names in Ancestry or just put out calls, you know, for folks to see if anyone had any idea and a lot of interviews. And that's kind of where the best stories come from, where just interviewing people who had rich memories of these places. What was it like working with Tim? He really brought a lot of that passion for living history. And it really is history of communities, histories of people and places and things. And I think that is what sets him apart and makes him such an important historian for McMenamins. Because it's not history of governments or, you know, these things. It's a really rich history of what creates community. He was trying to get at the heart of what makes the McMenamin buildings such an important part of history of the community. And for him, it was emphasizing and highlighting these histories that have been forgotten to time. And I think that is what Tim fights for and what he advocates for. And he, in and of himself, just became such a rich part of the history of preserving these buildings. And so he, in and of himself, is a part of the history of McMenamins. And I think that's something that's really, really special. Who'd have thought that all those years ago working with Tim as a kid would lead me down this path of wanting to hear stories and pass them on? He's a big reason why this podcast is so important now, and why even today, our historians continue to dig through newspapers and archives, research artifacts, and talk to more people. As a part of the second generation of leadership in McMinimins, we have a responsibility as we move forward to keep the history alive and keep it fresh. The history department is integral to the very nature of our company. Or as my dad would say, You couldn't separate it, really. It's part of the whole thing. I'm Shannon McMiniman. Thanks for listening. The Red Shed Tapes is produced by McMinimans. Jess is creative and Gretchen Kilby. Our writers are Kat Nyberg and Jess Linus of Jess is Creative. And our editor is Michelle Jake Robbins. Sound editing by Gretchen Kilby. The McMinimans production team includes Kat Nyberg, Renee Rank Ignacio, and Michelle Jake Robbins. 
Our podcast theme music was composed by Jim Brunberg and Ben Landsberg of Wonderly. Additional music from Epidemic Sound, Pond 5, and Blue Dot Sessions. And the podcast artwork is by Lillian Ripley. Thanks to all of the artists who have brought history to life at McMinimins, and a very special thanks to the Motley crew in this episode, including Lyle Hain and Kalia Bush. A cosmic expanse of gratitude to all of the UFO Festival guests and participants, as well as our crew at Hotel Oregon. And a special note, Dr. Bruce Maccabee passed away on May 10th, 2024. He conducted the most comprehensive study of the UFO sightings by Paul and Evelyn Trent, and he will be remembered as the brilliant sole speaker at McMinnman's first UFO event in the year 2000. Thanks to Sharon Nesbitt and the Troutdale Historical Society, and all the libraries, records offices, and historical societies in the Pacific Northwest. We're eternally grateful to Tim Hills, the historian who changed everything. He continues chasing history along with the entire McMinimins history department, including John Smart, Alicia Scholl, and Chloe Gladden. Find more of our history at McMinimins.com, and you can get in touch with us here at the Red Shed Tapes by emailing podcast at McMinimins.com. Mm-hmm.